Today on episode 2 of the LBV podcast we have footballer James Craigan on. James has played for teams such as Partick Thistle, Falkirk, Dunfermline, Arbroath and Rafe Rovers. Here are some of his career highlights. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the second edition of the LBV podcast. I'm delighted to say we have professional footballer James Craigan on today. How are you doing, James? Yeah, good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Uh, you've made 270 appearances in your career, scoring 24 goals uh, for teams such as Partick Thistle, Rafe Rovers, Falkirk, Dunfermline and Arbroath. Uh, first of all, how have you been dealing with lockdown? Um, yes, you know, it all came as a bit of a shock when it all happened. I think we played against Morton, what was it now, the 10th of March, maybe around that time, could be slightly wrong there, um, played against Morton away, 2 all draw, um, and then from then, it kind of like the Friday evening, the games got cancelled, and um, I managed to get back down to uh, Lancashire, where my parents live near Preston, me and my girlfriend went down there, and uh, before the lockdown, um, and then within a week, it was, uh, it was, it, yeah, it was lockdown, really, so... Um, it's not been too bad. It's been nice to spend a bit of time with the family. Um, you know, from my point of view, obviously, with you know, people lost loved ones as well, which is it, which is not nice. And you know, my thoughts go out to all those people. But uh, from my point of view, you know, we spent managed to have a lot of time with my family, which has been good and something that I probably not had been up in Scotland and they've been down yeah. there. So uh, it's been a nice period. Um, how have you been keeping fit during lockdown? Um, lots of different training sessions, really. Um, parents live in the countryside, so I've been doing walks, runs. Um, you know, five k jumped on the five k five k challenge as well. Five uh, k in the donut five k, so I got nominated to that for a couple of times. So downloaded the, the Strava app, which people seem to be seem to be on as well. So no, just a few uh, generic runs there, and then built that up to a bit of ball work. Um, I know a few lads down there who play football. So we all, as the lockdown has eased, we all kind of like met up in small groups and did a bit of ball work and shooting, etc. And so it's all. Always nice to do things, a bit of fitness with somebody else as well. Right, so we'll start a bit about your youth career. Um, how did you first get into playing football? Um, I think from an early age, um, my dad, you know, when I could walk, he was throwing a ball. I, walk, I think I showed a bit of interest by kicking a softball around the house <laughs> and then uh, in the garden he was, uh, he, he was, you know, feeding me a few balls. But I remember we always used to chuck one to my left foot and my right foot as well, try to keep the... <laughs> Keep, keep them both going. Um, and then he took me down to MySco College, which was, um, um, they had a session for, I must have been about six at the time, on Friday evenings. Um, I went to this, I think I was playing with guys, you know, a bit older than me at the time, lads a bit older than the time, like you know, eight to nine, uh, and showed a bit of promise. And from that, the, the coach said, oh, would you like to um, go to Black, Blackburn Rovers uh, holding these like trials? Um, so I went to these trials at Blackburn. It was every six weeks, every Saturday for six weeks. Right. And I think there was about 750 kids there. And I got, got down to the last 12. Then they asked me, so I was probably about seven at this point, after a year at MySco. And they asked me to sign a contract at Blackburn. Uh, at that point, uh, um, I had a knock on the door from Preston North End. Uh, and they'd asked me to sign the, the, uh, a contract with them and, they put me up in age group as well so I could play matches because you weren't supposed to play matches until you were under nines. And it was easy. My mum and dad, well, we lived in Preston, they worked there. So it was easy for them to, because they were going to have to transport me. So I ended up signing for Preston at eight years and I was, you know, there from eight years to 18. 
Uh, so I went all through the age groups, really. So I uh, had some great times there, great memories playing at Deepdale. We won a cup there under 12. So no, it's fun memories. But most of my youth career was probably spent at, well, it was spent at, at Preston North End. Um, was it a dream of yours to become a professional footballer? Mm. Yeah, it was. That's all I wanted to do, really. Um, all I wanted to do was play football from an early age. Um, you know, always stuck in there at school and probably not, you know, naturally they're probably the brightest, probably, you know, around that middle zone, but always, yeah. you know, homework or go outside and play a bit of football. Yeah. There's always going to be one winner. Um, so that's, yeah, always, always wanted to be a footballer. Um, so did you, you said the step up from the, the college. Um, how did you find the step up from the college to playing like a club like Preston? Um, yeah, I mean, at that age, you, you don't really kind of like, all you know is kind of like playing football, you know, for seven, six, seven, eight years old than, uh, well, yeah, six or seven. Um, you know, you're surrounded by better players. Yeah. Um, you know, I was quite lucky that I probably went in there as probably one of the best players at Preston as well, looking back, because um, I was playing up an age group as well from such an early age. But, you know, rather than your parents drop you off for a bit of football training, you go into Preston as... A, you want to be there, and you're there because you've got a bit of talent. Yeah, and that's showing promise. So it's a, rather than kind of like just participation, where some lads might not be interested, but the dad <laughs> wants them to go to uh, coaching. You're there because you know you've got a, you've got a bit of talent, and you're the, you're on the process to be to becoming a, a footballer, even at that early age. Um, did playing for Preston affect your social life or schoolwork? Um, probably, I would. From a younger age of Preston, probably not, no. I mean, games on Sunday. Um, but, you know, I'm growing up, getting to the 15, 16, there's probably a few more 17 parties going on on a yeah, Saturday night, which I never really went to. Um, so, yeah, you say it could affect you. You've got to be disciplined, of course. Um, but, no, I was always quite, you know, soci- sociable. Um, you know, I obviously would never go like, on, a, on, on a Saturday before a game. and uh, I'd, I'd miss out on a few things like that. But... Uh, I wouldn't say it kind of like affected my social life. Of course, I had to be disciplined, but yeah. it didn't feel like ever I was missing out because I knew that, well, I'm, I'm playing football on the Sunday anyway. So I kind of like, that, that was the norm for me. Um, you spent 10 years in total at Preston. In your time there, was there anyone who inspired you to like improve your game and pursue a career within football? Um, there was, in the youth team there, that Preston were a top six championship club at the time. Um, I know they just missed out on the playoffs this season narrowly. Um, but the captain at the time, we played centre midfield, and I'm Paul McKenna. You know, I used to watch, growing up, you know, watching him all, you know, all the way through. Me and my dad used to go to the games, and he used to give us a couple of tickets if you were part of the academy. And he, he was like the standout player. He always never gave the ball away and kind of like watched him play. And then we had Sean St. Ledger at the, at the back as well. As, as I grew, grew older, he was always kind of like friendly with the young lads as well. And I thought if I was going to be in the first team, I'd always like to have that interaction he did. I remember I used to have to get two buses to training. Uh, and then, you know, if he drove past, he'd pick me, so get the bus, he'd pick me up and take me into training if he drove past. And I always thought to myself, well, you know, I'd like to be like Ledge, like that, who, you know, showed an interest into the young lads. So for two different reasons, on the pitch, I'd say, playing my position, Paul McKenna, I kind of like watched and kind of like thought, you know, always doing extra fitness and stuff like that. But off the pitch, in terms of his interaction around the club, um, but someone like Sean St. Ledger, who would like, spend time and talk to the younger lads and stuff like that. And that's something that I've tried to do throughout, throughout, throughout my career as well, is keep, you know, keep in touch with younger players and try, try and help them. Um, so the, you then left Preston uh, and also England to come up to Scotland and start studying at Edinburgh University. Uh, yeah. What did you study there and what made you want to come up to Scotland? Um, so... As I was at, you know, at Preston, I always carried on with my A-levels. I think you call it high as here, is it? Um, yeah. in, Scot- in Scotland, and they're roughly, I think, they're about the same, aren't they? Um, so I always kept up with them and got released at 18 from Preston. Uh, and then I'd applied to um, Leeds University, Loughborough and Edinburgh. And I think Loughborough's kind of like the, the big sporting university in, yeah. um, in England. And to be fair, they never gave me an offer anyway, so I didn't get into Loughborough. So it was between Leeds and Edinburgh, and I just thought, I came up to view them uh, in probably like the April time, yeah. uh, where I kind of knew that I was probably looking like I was going to get released from Preston. And you know, I thought, you know, great city, 
Uh, I'd been to visit when I was like seven once before. I thought I didn't know anyone else who was going there. Right. Um, so I was like, well, you know, this it's like good university on paper. It sounded like a great university in a good city. And the football team, um, they had a football team who competed in like the books. Uh, so I was like, oh, we'll, we'll go for this bit, the new adventure. We'll, we'll see what comes of it. And I went to study sports business management. Um, <coughs> you know, coming from that football background, I was always in, interested in that kind of side of things. So um, that was like a natural, natural choice, really. And they were one of the universities that specialised in, in, in that course. Um, so uh, you played football for the university. Um, was there a big difference between playing for a university team compared to like a team like Arbroath that you're at now? Um, yeah, obviously, you know, Arbroath is now sat in the championship. Um, yeah, yeah, university. And what I would say about my university football is that the program they had at the time, and and they still do. They play in, they play in the Lowland League now, so they're playing at a very good level on a Saturday. Yeah. At that time, I was there. It was the East of Scotland League, so it was the yeah. highest below the pyramid yeah. uh, that they could play in. So we used to train Mondays, um, Monday evenings. We used to train Tuesday with the strength and conditioning in the gym. Wednesdays we were playing against other universities. Thursdays was training. Fridays we didn't have anything, and Saturdays we were playing in the East of Scotland League. So it was actually a full, and as well as you wanted to do obviously your studies and a few nights out here and there dotted mm-hmm. around as well. Um, so it was actually a programme was pretty much full time really. And that's something that when I arrived there, um, you know, I was used to kind of that aspect. So I was like, oh, this is absolutely fantastic. So you kind of like feel the mold, you're, you're continuing your football education really as well. Um, so no, and we had a good team and from that, um, I don't know, we'll speak about it later, but from that Edinburgh Uni team, you can like uh, can progress into Scottish unis, which is like a select squad. Yeah. Um, so we had um, so the best players in Scotland um, p- plucked out from all different universities, um, and they play in like a books home nations tournament against England universities, w- Wales, right. uh, Ireland. So it's not done of your nationality; it's done of whereabouts, geography, or what, yeah. what university you go to. Um, so to play in that was brilliant. So and there's a lot of players that. Um, playing that select squad, Danny Denham, who's forged a career, Gav Mallon played there, Omar, uh, Kadir, um, you, you see Blair Lyons, who went through the university program, who's now signed at Party Pistol through Montrose. There's a network of people in higher education who maybe have developed late or um, been maybe not quite, quite good enough at the time or um, playing sheer amount of games, that's what helped me, playing 55 yeah. games a season at university level. Um, improved me massively so that's what I'd always say that there's some hidden gems in there and you know the, the standard was good yeah going back to your original question the standard was good and um, you said that the training was almost uh, like full time um, did that impact your studies um, no not really I think you know the first two years in Scottish University they don't really count in the degree so probably loosely had that in there not saying the, that I wasn't trying but it was make sure just get the pass really <laughs> and then I'll say the two years after that you know um, count and uh, ramped up the, the studying kind of the essays kind of like the dissertations get, um, get a bit more serious so no I think you know it's a period of life uh, where you decide to go to university and it's learning how to balance different things and you know there's a few le- last minute deadlines you know in the library till three in the morning trying to get things done um, but that's all part of parcel of it and it's yeah. uh, you know a, a learning, learning experience uh, I soon found that found out that I was probably better working with, under a bit of pressure when the time got to it and actually sitting down with two weeks to go and having to get an essay, write an essay. Um, you then finished your studies at Edinburgh University and then joined uh, Partick Thistle. Um, how did your move to Thistle come about? Yeah, so it was actually my third year at university. Um, I was playing for the Scottish University Select Squad. Right. Um, and we played like friendlies against Stenhouse, Muir, Falkirk, Partick Thistle and we played against Partick Thistle. Um, and we beat them, I think it was their, so half their youth team, a few of the first team lads who hadn't played on the weekend. Yeah. I remember my good friend now, Comrade Balatoni, he was playing actually centre-half for them. I always wind up about this. Um, we beat them 7-2. We absolutely destroyed them. We played 4-2-3-1 and we had a great passing side. So Jackie McNamara was the manager and he watched and he contacted me and said, um, do you fancy coming for a trial next season? This was in the April, so do you fancy coming in July for a trial? Um, by that stage... You know, I had a few teams. I think Rafe Rovers were looking at me. I had a couple of teams down south. I'd managed to play for Great Britain University's team. So I knew that it was a, a bit of interest, kind of like 
there. Yeah, yeah. But also at the same time, I had a year left of my studies yeah. after that. So um, I went for the trial. I went for the trial. Uh, did well at the trial, and part of this offered me a two-year contract um, off the back of their week. Um, so I'd been down to England as well for a, a trial at Team England, but they'd offered me a contract. But third part of this, I thought good opportunity. Jackie wanted to play a passing style football, which suited me, and they wanted to try and win the league. Yeah. Um, so I know I just just went for it, and then um, I managed to finish off my studies, my final year of university, uh, part time, and split my final year over two years while I was playing for Pass of Thistle. Um, um, you said that Jackie McNamara was the manager at Thistle. Um, did his experience help you with the jump up the leagues to the first division? Um, yeah, it did. Yeah, he, you know, he said that you're a good player. And, um, you, you've got the talent and skill set to be. You, we've not signed you just to make up the numbers. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter where you've come from. And you might have come from university. Some lads might have come from Motherwell or Celtic, but you're here on merit and you've got the ability. So just believe in yourself. And that's what he said, really. Um, you know, there's a few doubts. If you're not, I, when I first went to Partick, I wasn't playing every week because the lads were winning. Yeah. They won 12 on the bounce when I first got there and I went out on loan. But, you know, he was always like, he said, you've got the talent, just just keep believing in yourself. And that's something I've tried to do all, all the way through really, and something that I try and pass on to younger players. Um, so you said about um, you weren't in the team, you went out on loan. Um, you went to Forfar for a couple of months. Um, do you think you needed that loan move to really prove yourself to Jackie? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, it was an eye-opener meeting Dick Campbell for the first time, who's now my manager now. Yeah. Um, I remember I called him Dick on the first session and he was like, no, it's not Dick. It, it's gaffer to you, James. Uh, sat in, in 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 the changing rooms. And it was like, I I get the bayonets on. We're going to the trenches today. I was like, what's going on? What's going on there? Not used to not used to this. But no, it's a great experience, and I, I loved it. And I remember playing East Fife away my first game for Forfar, and I didn't have played centre midfield. I didn't have the best game. Got beat, and then played Stranra away after that. So the camel trip to Stranra, and. Uh, I think it was 2-1 down and I got in for a tackle and I didn't think it was a red card but the ref thought it was a yellow at max the referee sent me off so I'm like oh my goodness we've got beat in my first game we're getting beat in my second game I've just got a straight red and I'd only been there for four games for a month that was my loan for a month I was like that's my loan done I'm going to go back Jackie's not going to be happy with me and, you know, I've not really had, had time to improve, impress because I've been sent off and I was thinking oh my goodness so thankfully they extended it for another another month after that or another two months and um no, and you know, played well, scored two at Albion Rovers. Um, Christy Elliott was on loan at Albert, Albion Rovers from Partick at the time, and we played each other. It's, just, it's been our Christmas night at, 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 like two days before, so we we're all a bit kind of like tired. And, um, but we were saying, Oh, I'm playing you on the Monday night, aren't I? This day, you no, know, we both had a good game, and then got called back uh, by Jackie, right? Um, after Christmas at the end of January, and then kind of managed to get in the team, um. For Calvin Beef game, we won that. You know, we always said it's once you get the shirt, it's yours to lose, and the team won. Right. Uh, we did well, and then he left really. So it was like all that six months it took me to get in the team, and then Jack, Jackie had left really. So, uh, but no, it was definitely the, the loan at four definitely toughened me up, uh, got me used to playing a bit more games because I hadn't really played that much since I'd signed. I was playing a few reserve games, um, so it was my first kind of experience to the league, and definitely something that you know really benefited me. So, as you mentioned, Fissel were flying at the top of the league, um, tipped to win the promotion to the Premier League. Um, you had some great players at the time, uh, Chris Erskine, Stephen uh, Lawless, uh, Dylan, Balatoni, Bannigan. Who of the, that part of Fissel played would you say was the most talented? It's a tough question, that. Very tough question, because I'd say that season, you know, Erskine was fantastic in that division. Erskine, Lawless, Taylor Sinclair on the left back, yeah. O'Donnell, Stephen O'Donnell on the right back, you know, it was Bannigan, who was a young player coming through, was brilliant. And then, obviously, Comrade Bags probably about eight goals from centre-half. And, you know, I think after the year after we got promoted, I think um, Taylor Sinclair probably had the best move to Wigan, who had just got beaten in the playoffs um, for the, to get into the Premier League. Right. Didn't really, obviously, work out for him there. Um, and, obviously, like Stephen O'Donnell, you know, progressed to being a full Scotland international. Um so it's probably too hard to kind of like say he was the most talented, really. It's it's difficult. Everyone had their own like lawless in and around the box. A bit of magic, going to stick one in the top corner. Um, 
No, so it's it probably too hard for me to say, but we had, we had a really good team and, you know, someone like Stuart Bannigan, who's been really unlucky with injuries and, you know, he's playing obviously still for part of Thistle. He's got 10 years there, but he definitely could play higher. And yeah. I know he had a chance to go and play um, for, I think, Bristol City or Barnes, who were interested in him at one point and just bad luck with injuries. So he's definitely someone who's a very, very good player. Uh, we'll move on to the title-winning game against Morton. Uh, how special is it, was it to score that decisive goal to confirm Fistle's promotion? Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably what I'm kind of remembered for at Partick, is, is that goal and then the celebration, the arms out celebration, giving the ball boy a little, uh, jumping into the ball boy as well. Um, but no, looking back, it was just like unbelievable, really. 10,000 people packed into Fir Hill. I don't think they've got had that many crowds, that many in Fir Hill since then. Oh, Kickoff was played by 15 minutes because everyone couldn't get in. And, you know, I just... Look, right place, right time, really. The ball came across the edge of the box and I was thinking in my head saying, hit the target, don't sky it, don't sky it. And left foot, good contact and, you know, it, it went in and kind of like that. People asked me, what were you thinking afterwards? I was like, I can't really remember the like, next 20 seconds. It was just some sort of like, feel you're on a different planet and it was just yeah. a buzz to score. And, you know, it turned out at that point that that was the winning goal and we won 1-0. So everyone remembers that goal as the as the tied to winning goal. So, no, it's looking back, great memories. and looking Another great so lucky, lucky enough to go and play at Chris Dillon's testimonial and see some of the fans again, and that was that was special talking about it. So another great day that season was the game against Falkirk, where the oh, yeah. Chris Erskine scored. I remember. I think I remember. I watched it the other week. Well, really good goal. Uh, how special was that day for you with the fans and just packed yeah, out? Yeah, that, that goal. I think we only needed a point, and I yeah. think I was playing centre midfield that day, kind of like a bit deeper. And we were just like, we'd hit the bar in the first half. And, you know, you didn't really want to, you wanted to go out and win it. You wanted yeah. to go out and win it, really. Um, and then I think we were, was it Andy Dowie scores from a set piece, header. And then obviously Squiddy, uh, Chris Erskine uh, had done that, scored goals like that all season. You know, he's um, knocked it past two and then just slot, slotted it home. So, no, he, he, he'd done that all season. That was a really special day that I remember past the fans filled the whole goal behind the Falkirk yeah. Stadium and then at the half as well and obviously we knew we'd won it we went in um, and to change rooms came back out and celebrated with them and then I think a few of us went to the Star and Garth pub as well that evening as well to, to celebrate with them so that, uh, you know, it's fantastic and I always remember Alan Archibald afterwards saying you know that was my first year in full-time football in yeah. professional, professional football and, and Alan Archibald said enjoy this because you know, you never know how many times this doesn't happen all the time. You never know how it comes, and you know, you, probably because my first year, we take that comment with a bit of a pinch of salt. Yeah, because you know, it's, it's all an experience. But obviously, I've not won a title since, and that's eight years down the line. So that's something that I'd always say to any player: is like enjoy, enjoy. And to be fair, we did enjoy it. We enjoyed it for about three weeks after that. <laughs> that was the only achievement you you've got that season. You've got to the final of the Challenge Cup, where you narrowly lost it in penalties to Queen of the South. How devastating was that? As considering it was your first professional cup final. Yeah, we you know we were gutted. We wanted to win the game. Probably the worst we'd played as a team all season, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's because we thought we had the league big game on the Wednesday, and you know, probably I wouldn't say let the fans down because we always gave one hundred and ten percent. But no, that would have been nice to do the double that year. Um, just obviously wasn't meant to be, and uh, be on penalties. Um, but no, obviously. Cup final, you always want you want to win it. It's not something that I kind of like look back on and I'm, um, a massive regret in my career. Um, but it's something it would have been nice to to do the double that season, I suppose. Yeah. Especially after Chris Dillon's goal and the celebrations that followed. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah the, the pitch invasion. There. <laughs> I love people from down south in England. I think from Leeds or something there was. When yeah. I came with these like English accents, and they weren't my friends. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, they jumped on the pitch, and you know, you thought that if it's meant to be there. You score last minute, you get the momentum and you might go and win it, but, you know, we just couldn't get over the line. And Queen of the South, I remember playing them against Forfa right. um, when I was alone there. And they were a good side that year. They had Nicky Clark banged all the goals in. James Carmichael was a good player. Uh, so, no, fair, fair play to them. So, promotion to the Premiership followed and also you got your first two stuff top play Scottish football. Um, yeah. I remember a moment from that season being the one at Tyne Castle to secure Partick safety. Um, did you always yeah. think that that team would be strong enough to avoid the drop? I think so, yeah. I mean, first game of the season against Dundee United, we showed that we probably should have won it. And then the other home game, which was the first TV game, was the Hearts as well. Yeah. We played, we played well there. 
So I thought we would have enough. We we started off on fire. First two months, we were playing, you know, carrying on that form of great football in, but we probably weren't getting the results we deserved. Yeah. And I remember around the Christmas period, we didn't pick up any points and we were slipping down towards the bottom, but we were absolutely battering teams. Right. And then it would be a last minute defeat or last minute equaliser. Um, so, no, I always knew we had enough and came to the split and all all games in the split are six pointers. Yeah, yeah. And then we went to Hibs and Sam Stanton scored the last minute. And if we'd won that game, we wouldn't all the way through, Doolan had scored and we would have been safe. Um, but it wasn't meant to be. But we finished the job off on the Tuesday, and, and you know that was another great, another great ga- game. I was living in Edinburgh at the time. A few of us were living in Edinburgh. And family all came up for that, and you know, two-one down. Our, you know, we, I remember Archie saying, you know, we've, yeah, you know, come on, not turn up here. And we came out second half, and that blew them away really. And, you know, just a sense of relief when Cam Higginbottom smashed the rebound in uh, to make it four. And I was like thinking, four, four, two, come on, is it safe now with like ten minutes to play? So I, uh, a game that. I watched actually they did the in in lockdown actually back and uh, it brought back good brought back good memories. I think his celebrations described the whole team's emotions that day. Oh, just relief, sense of relief, yeah. Yeah. Um, sense of relief. So no, it was, it was good. Uh, a standout player from your time at Thistle was a uh, striker Lyle Taylor, um, who's gone on to score many many goals in England for uh, Charlton. Uh, can you tell that Lyle had the ability to get to the level uh, he is currently achieving? Yeah, Lyle always had the ability from the first day he walked in, you know, different type of strikes to do and strong, quick, hold the ball up. Um, I think Lyle, you know, when he was younger back then, he was just making sure, you know, being happy, being happy and getting his mental state right. And that's something he's done since being more back home, close to uh, close to London. And, yeah. But he always had the ability and what I was saying to him was like, you know, you can keep, keep at it. You're going to go and have a great, great career and, go and do something and it looks like he's going to get a fantastic move whether that might be to Rangers or you know some top, top championship club I don't, I don't know but he's always had the ability there yeah After two seasons in the Premiership you joined Championship side Rafe Rovers uh, where you were the top goal scorer for the side uh, scoring nine goals that season uh, also Rafe Rovers got the playoffs that season uh, what are your fondest memories from that year? Um, you know it was nice to score goals that, that's something that I was quite happy with my performances in the SPL and made a lot of appearances. I was, I think it was 28 in the first season starts and 22 in the second season. Um, you know, possibly looking back, I was told I wasn't going to be first choice at uh, Partick and as a 24-year-old, don't want to be told that. At yeah. 24, you're not going to be first choice. So, decision that I had to make to, to go to Pastures New and you know, you, you might always think, well, actually, no, I could have forced my way into the side and stuff like that, but it wasn't meant to be. Yeah. I obviously would have liked to have stayed to play in the SPL. And I thought maybe I'd done well enough to go and have a bit more interest from the other SPL teams, but nothing came about. So I signed for Rafe and um, with a manager, Ray McKinnon, who wanted to get to, um, believed in me and wanted to, to get, make the playoffs. And we had a great year. We had a good squad and uh, we were on a fantastic run from Christmas. That run in from Christmas onwards, yeah. uh, we were probably the form side of the of the league. Uh, beat Rangers at home. Um, play always played well. I think Hibs, to be fair, beat us. But um, you know, we we did, we did really well, and we had a tight tight unit, and we had a good team. And it was obviously a bonus for me in the individually scoring a few goals, which is what I probably needed to add. Yeah. So if I added those goals, that I'd always got in good positions for Partick, and maybe it just snatched at chances and I think if it would have been a different story I just converted a few and I think I just needed that one to drop in at Rafe and everything seemed to click really um, so I know I had, I had a good year and it, it was a good team performance narrowly you know getting beaten in the playoffs by, by Hibs So then you moved on to the really talented Falkirk side uh, a year after their playoff heartbreak against uh, Kilmarnock uh, they had really good players at that team at the time uh, uh, Craig Sibble, John Baird, Mark Kerr, Luke Leahy. Um, that year you finished second place uh, and then the playoffs followed and that was probably a memorable time for you as well. I got at Tannadice, <laughs> a lovely finish and then the goal the, away at the second leg at the Falkirk Stadium. Um, did you think that Falkirk, that Falkirk team had the ability to get promotion that year? Yeah, to be honest, I thought that was going to be the year. I played off heartache with race the year before and we finished second that year so we didn't have to play the, the third v fourth round and we've beaten Dundee United twice already um, 
two all draw at Dundee United, probably with a better team. Yeah. Bring back to Fulham Stadium, I'd scored early on in absolute cruise control in that playoffs, and then you know probably a, def- a couple of defensive areas, and we end up going two one. It all happened so quick, conceding two goals in the last ten minutes, and you know we were, you know, that was to go and play Hamilton, and we we fancied ourselves really. And that's probably looking back, kind of like that year we had a good team. And yeah. no, that was dis- really disappointing that we'd, you know, we 10, 15 minutes concentration towards the end of that game, and it all came kind of came tumbling down really. Um, but no, that, that was that was tough to take really. And you know, from then I always felt that when I played for Falkirk and, and I played centrally, I scored goals, and, and the stats would back that up. And for me, you know, probably didn't I, I didn't I didn't feel that um, I got the trust from the manager at that time to go on. For the next season, um, to go and say right to be one of the main players, I thought I deserved it more of a shot. Um, to, to go and either play, play a central role and a, and a and a key role, and then I found myself out of the team um, for the start of the next league campaign, really, which was I couldn't really get my head around, and you know things kind of like didn't work out as well for myself at Falkirk or or, or, or the club really. Um, so then that was disappointing after we got so close uh, the year before. Would you say that your goal at Tanner Dice was one of your best of your career? Yeah, I think it's absolutely probably one of the most important at the time. Um, I remember scoring a volley against um, Rafe, for Rafe against Alo, which was outside the box, which was top corner. Yeah. Uh, left foot, left foot, chest and volley. And I think it made the PFA goal of the season contender. I think yeah. one of the old firm teams won. I'm not sure how that always works. But uh, I think Barry Mackay's won against in the Scottish Cup won that year. Yeah. Remember the goal at Hamden? Yeah. Um, but now put that that the volley at Tanner Dice on the vol- all the volley at for Rafe against Harlow was right. they were they were two up there. You said after that you were out of the team at the start of the season for Falkirk, uh, and then in the January you signed for rivals Dunfermline. Uh, yeah, how did the move to the Powers come about? Um, pretty much surplus to requirements at Falkirk. Um, new manager came in. Um, I think I started two games, thought I'd done all right, and then. Uh, um, they wanted to go down a different route, and he was he got rid of myself, Lee Miller, Mark Kerr, um, tried to go down the route of bringing other players in, and the, 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 I'm fair to say that didn't work. I don't think he um, lasted his job t- too far after that. Um, but no, um, don't, I knew Dunfermline were interested. I think they may have been interested in the summer, to be fair. Um, and then yeah, signed there uh, uh, for. Um, in the January and enjoyed the six months really playing, you know, more centrally in the midfield role that I wanted to play in. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, we got to the playoffs and, you know, loved it. And, you know, definitely one of my favourite spells along with Partick Thistle, I'd say, was at, was at Dunfermline. As the games went on for Dunfermline, you were becoming a real fan favourite uh, in the lead up to the playoffs. Uh, with one game standing out being the victory away at Falkirk. Um, I wanted to ask you this question because you've played for both Dunfermline and Falkirk. Um, Coming from a player's perspective, how big a derby is Dunfermline versus Falkirk in terms of the rivalry and the competitiveness? Yeah, no, it is big. It's big. Um, away support, they always each team always takes a big away support. They fill in most sides, and you know, with situations that maybe have gone over the last couple few years. Um, no, it's a big derby, and you know, you want to go. I've been quite lucky enough that I've not really been on the losing side for of each team's derby runs there. And I've won a couple for Falkirk at Dunfermline. I've also won a couple away at uh, Falkirk as well. Um, so, no, um, big derby. Big derby, probably underestimated, really. Obviously, it's, it's nowhere big as your old firm or your, your Edinburgh derby. But, no, it's, it's good and it means a lot to people there. So, it's it's good to play. Always good, always like a good atmosphere. And you're getting a bit of... Having played for both teams as well, you're always getting a bit of extra, a bit of extra spice there as well. So... After a 95th minute equaliser up in Inverness, then a 4 0 win versus Dumbarton, uh, Dunfermline secured the playoffs. Uh, and that's a third successive playoff run for yourself. Uh, mm-hmm. Another two legged tie against Dundee United followed, with Dunfermline narrowly lost out at Tannadice. Uh, with being at the game, I could tell the players were as gutted as the fans. Um, same as the last season with Falk. Did you think Dunfermline were good enough to get promoted that year? Yeah, I mean, we went, we battled on for 10 men at East End Park. Yeah. Uh, Ashley got sent off. And, you know, we did, held it tight. It didn't really trouble us, held it tight, really. And thought, well, take, we fancy our chances there. And then blew them away. First 45 at Tannadice, I think you'll have to admit. We should have been three up. I mean, Declan and Manage missed a one on one. 
Um, obviously, Nicky Clark scored. I think we had Ryan Williams and probably could have played a better pass over. He could have scored. We should have been going in at 3 0. And you always think in your back of your mind when you've been that much on top, you need to be getting, a, you need to convert your chances. And another kind of like conceded fairly early, and then a good goal from Stan, Stanton. And you know, we, we didn't really pack a punch to be fair after that. We didn't really create anything. Manager put big John, John and Voto up front for the last 20 minutes that. You know, I've probably surprised as anyone looking back. I don't think the manager would have probably have done that now, but we were by far the better team and so disappointed. They were there for the taking. And the worst thing was, is we had Livy's number. Yeah. Livingston were playing there and we, 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 we'd beaten them at home a few weeks before. We'd drawn away with them at one of my first games, which it was a battle. But we, you know, when we played Livingston, we rolled our sleeves and thought, oh, we'll, we'll dig in here. Yeah. And that's, and I always think that first half, we should have, the game should have been out of sight and we should have cut the game. Just seen the game out for the second half, because um, it wasn't a great United side, really. No. Um, I don't know you, you at the game. What, what, what did you feel? I, I thought we should have been way ahead in the first half. Like, yeah. I mean, the fact that you're shooting at the fans, like, oh no, yeah, the fans are getting right behind us, and I just thought that we should have won that game easily. I oh, know it was just two mistakes with the goals. And then, Two mistakes as well. I think someone slipped and then ricochet off Carl Morris as well. Yeah. Um, I know. It's just, and it was the fact that Dundee United the year before as well and felt like in control. And that first half, that's probably the best we played all season. We was on, probably because we were shooting into our own fans yeah. as well. And it was like a couple of my mates came up from Preston as well on the train and they'd piled in last minute. I sort of spotted them. And that no, was a great, it was a great game. It was a great game. And we were on, on top and it, you know, could have been. Could have been three or four in that first half, and we could have had the game killed off. Um, but you know, it just wasn't meant to be. Um, the film got the revenge at the start of the next season with a yeah. few win at Tannadice. Um Would you say that would be up there one of your favourite games of your career? Um, yeah, it was a good game. Probably, you know, probably first league game of the season. Really, I always preferred the, the towards the end of the campaigns. Um, but no, a good game, and you know. We'd done well in the League Cup. We'd played 3-5-2. I think that was the first game that I played right wing back in my career. I was asked to play there. Asked to play there a couple days before the game. Ryan Williamson was suspended from the previous season. So I played there, did all right. Um, and probably that's where I played for most of the season was right back, right wing back. Uh, I think I played every position that year apart from goalkeeper. Um, but no, um, yeah, good game. And I think after that, everyone full of optimism and you know, we then had Ross County next and we got 2-0, 2-1. 2-1 that game or 2-0, I can't remember. Um, so, no, it was it, it was a great result, but, you know, that year was, dis- the way it turned out was, was hugely disappointing because I know the club had invested quite a bit on the squad because we, we nearly got there and, you know, at the end of the day, collectively, we, we weren't good enough. So, after my table finished with Dunfermline, you decided to take a new challenge and have a crack in the English leagues with Van Armour National side uh, filed. Since becoming an established professional footballer in Scotland, did you always want to have a crack in England? Yeah, I did. Um, I've been through the youth system, the youth um, in England, and I always fancied a, a, a change. Ideally, I would have liked to have gone straight into the Football League, um, but it's hard to, once you not play the senior appearance in the Football League, it's hard to get down there, really. Uh, and even if you've played in there and you've been in Scotland for three or four years, you've soon forgotten about it. There's so many players in England. Um, so, you know, Fad had just been narrowly beaten by Salford City in the playoff final um, that in, in the summer. So, you know, joining Fad, they were favourites to go up. Yeah. Um, location-wise, it was near near my family home, uh, an ideal fit, really. So, joined there and, uh, you know, all started off so well. After the first couple of weeks of the season, we were flying and then kind of like all went... All, all, all went downhill really. Then you know the manager that had signed me got got sacked, um, and then you know the new manager came in who he he had his own kind of like thoughts and own players, and I struggled to get into the team, which um, disappointing really because when I played, I'd done well. I just felt that I never really got an opportunity down there yeah. uh, from from October onwards, and even when the team wasn't doing well, it was it, you know you think that. You, you kind of like banging your head against a, a brick wall saying, you know, any, can I get a crack at it, please? Yeah. And, you know, I can't, I obviously can't speak for the manager at the time. Obviously, got, on a personal level, got on with him really well, but in the day you want to be playing and reluctantly, uh, I don't, the lads down there were fantastic as well. And um, reluctantly, um, 
he let me leave. I was trying to push a loan move through in January, from early January, and managed to went right down to the deadline day uh, and managed to push a loan move to to our bros. But you know, going back from leaving Dunfermline, it's something that at the time I think they decided to go a different route with the recruitment. Um, you know, I had chats about staying and stuff like that, and um, you know, just wasn't kind of like a meant to be in terms of kind of like uh, finances really really like that and, but you know I'd always have always say that you know, Stevie Crawford and, and and Ross always had a great relationship with them and I'm still in touch with them uh, g- going forward and um, they're all you know the good people and hopefully I think Stevie will do do a good job there and you've got someone like Ross behind the scenes who he you, you, you really cares for the club so and there's a lot of great people in that club as well so like I said probably when I left uh, left to anyone who asked that that I really enjoyed the 18 months and probably looking back, I wish that maybe I'd stay, I'd stayed longer and Bill kept up that rapport with the fans. But, you know, um, it, at that point you're thinking, well, there's a bit of interest from elsewhere that you fancy a new challenge, but it's one of the things that the new challenge probably didn't, didn't work out and I'm, I'm, I'm back up in Scotland. I wanted you to stay. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I did as well. It was, it, it, was, it, was, it was difficult. And, you know, I think well, the chats I had with the manager as well, They'd wanted to go down. They wanted to bring a few players in that they thought they could probably re- resell as well. And he already had a few players on the contract as well. Um, that it would be hard to move on, uh, move on. Whereas I, unfortunately, I was coming to the end of my current contract. And he had players in my position that uh, who were already there, which was going to be a difficult one. Uh, and was I a right? That was my centre midfield player. So um, yeah. no, it's good. But it was all left kind of like uh, and um You know, I think they've made some good business, done some good business already this year. And I think there could be a, you know, have a really good chance. Obviously, I know Paul Watson well, and he's a good player, just won the league with um, Dundee United. So I think, you know, the way he's done his business this year is, is you know, it looks positive for, yeah. for Dunfermline. and hopefully not against us there. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> well, in January this year, uh, you said you came back up to Scotland to sign for the surprise package in the Scottish Championship this season at uh, Arbroath. Uh, sadly, obviously, the season was cut short due to the coronavirus, but Arbroath sitting firmly in mid table, good position. Yeah. Uh, then recently, you signed a three year deal to permanently stay at Arbroath uh, to secure your future for the foreseeable future. Was the manager Dick Campbell's experience a big influence in signing on with Barbrough? Yeah, it was. It was the the manager and all the coaching staff there, the players that they've got, and the ambition of the club really. And obviously, the underlying factor of a three year contract as well is you know um, something that's a, a a big push. I think any professional footballer say that something like that gets you know put in front of you, you, you want to sign. And yeah, that you know that takes me up to kind of like thirty two and. Um, Obviously, it's a like part-time basis, but I'm probably ready to do something else as well at the same time. And I'm, you know, still playing in the championship, which is, you know, the, the, a similar a similar level. So, um, and everything that's you know happening with the pandemic and COVID, it makes you take stock. And you know, the lots of players are going to be out of contracts and and struggling. So it's something you know when they got the opportunity there to sign, um, uh, I, I was thrilled to do so. And I think that we've got the squad there to. To, to have another successful season and carry on the good work that the coaching staff and the players have already done. So, uh, uh, no. One player that stands out at uh, Arbroath is uh, Tam O'Brien. Uh, he's got, also got a new contract at Arbroath. Um, how crucial is he to the Arbroath team? Yeah, good player. I mean, he signed a new signing before. He signed an, ex, an extra three years. I think he's actually got four years left on his contract now. Uh, but no, Tom's a good player, and it, you know, I played with, when I was at university. I trained a bit with Cardiff Beef because he trained in Edinburgh, just loosely, not to sign, just to keep my eye on yeah. Jimmy Nichols, the manager, and my uni manager knew Jimmy. Um, so I used to go away. So I knew Tom from then. He's probably in, he was younger there. He was in that the the Cardiff Beef side, but that last year he was playing probably the best football of his career. He'll say that to himself. He's so confident, and um, obviously being rewarded with the contracts. And I think a few teams were. To, uh, but yeah. coming in from him and putting offers in for him but you know he's built up a, a career outside of football as well and probably makes more economic sense for him to stay at the part-time level and you know at 28 29 to keep that uh, to go down that route which is which is fair enough and you know he's playing playing in the championship and captain of a side that uh, are doing well so I can understand that um we'll talk about a bit about the future um so after you eventually retire in a few years time 
<laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> football. Uh, do you plan to stay in football in a coaching format or will you be pursuing a career uh, out of football? Um, I hope to stay in the sports industry. Um, you know, I'm passionate about tennis, passionate about golf. Yeah. Um, so whether that's, um, you know, across sport in general, I hope to stay in. Um, or a sports side themed job. That's the plan. I've, you know, I'm, I've not got any, I've not turned around and say that, you know, I've been doing a bit of coaching, which I've been enjoying as well. I, I like coaching. I've been doing a few one-to-one sessions, you know, down in Preston as, as the lockdown's eased. Um, you know, I haven't really thought about management as of yet. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm just keeping all options open, really. Uh, all options open and we'll see, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, you know, it's, it's a nice position to be in that I've got a bit more security now and I can go and explore different avenues uh, to go down. So definitely I'd like to stay in, 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 in sport and obviously you know, maybe football, but I'm just see, seeing what's out there really and, you know, going from there. Um, final couple of questions. Uh, this will probably be a tricky one. Uh, best player you've ever played with and why? Best player? They asked me best, best player I've played with. From the season at Partick Thistle in, this, in the year we stayed up, first year we stayed up, from the January to the end of the season, Callum Higginbottom was unplayable. Yeah. If you saw his stats from that period of assist goals, he was carrying the team. He was assisting every game, if, or he's either assisting or scoring every game. He was unplayable. Yeah. So that six months, I'd say he was the best player that I probably played with. Um, in terms of can I, his ability to like, the, the, you know, his, like I said, keep repeating myself here, but his it, it, it stats, his it's contributions. Yeah. You know, the player who's probably done the best is probably Lyle Taylor, you know, um, in terms of the level he's played at. Yeah. Um, but I'd probably give it to give it to Higgy there, and he'd probably be listening, so he'd be delighted with that as well. Um, last question: If you could give one piece of advice for a young up and coming footballer, what would it be? Commitment, stick at it. Uh, you've got to be passionate for it. Yeah. Um, I'd also say keep your options open, carry on with everything. Look at you know my journey. Ten years at a football club, released, had to, went into university, and then picked it back up. Just keep everything, keep everything open, stick in there at school. Uh, enjoy it as well and you know ment- mentality as well as you know it's it's discipline so many aspects to to, be, to being a football but make sure you enjoy it as well don't put too much pressure on yourself um, so that's what that, that's what I'd say to, to, to the up and coming future stars thank you for your time there James it's been great chat um, that's episode 2 of the LBV podcast uh, thanks for listening and we'll see you in the next one